this morning praying, but we are glad you have joined us today. Uh, I believe the whole world is praying about this coronavirus, and uh, we are no different, so we've joined everyone in praying. And I just have a short word of exhortation for us this morning. From wherever you are joining us, the Lord bless you, and thank you for joining us. Please don't forget to share this video, and may the Lord richly bless you as you do that. Right, today, I just want to run up the second part of courage for champions only. And we have defined courage as the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, or pain. It is the choice and willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. Courage is something we need on a daily basis. We also learned that there are two sides to courage, physical courage, which is the bravery in the face of physical pain, hardship, death, or threat of death. This coronavirus is a threat of death. Amen. But we are not afraid and we will not be afraid. But we will not also be careless. Amen. But let us also be careful and follow all the instructions that the medical experts have given. We also talked about moral courage. And moral courage is the ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, or personal loss. So sometimes something is going to cost you. You know it will cost you. And your, you know your answer should be no. All right? Courage will help you to say no. Amen. Amen. That's what we are talking about. And that's moral courage. Praise the Lord. Now, some courage is something we must all learn to master each day because it is becoming more and more difficult to openly practice our faith in this postmodern era. Is that true? Yes. So every day, you need a dose of courage. You pray. You say, Lord, give me courage to face the day today. Hallelujah. Lord, give me courage as I go to work. Give me courage as I go for this interview. Lord, give me courage as I, you know, go about my housework. Give me courage as I study. We, ha we need courage on a day-to-day -day basis. Even as you, you know, socialize with your friends, pray and say, Lord, give me courage to be a Christian among my friends. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 to 8, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear and a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Hallelujah. God has given us the power of what? The, 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 he has given us the spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Some translations will say, sound mind. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Right. Last week, we also saw from Proverbs 24, verse 10. I'm going to read up to 12 today. Proverbs 24, verse 10 to 12. The Bible says that if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. Rescue those who are unjustly sen sentenced to death. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you know, knows you knew. He will repay all people as their action deserves. So courage also manifests in our action. Sometimes I can tell or we can all tell a person is courageous by their action. The way you act will tell us whether you are timid or whether you are courageous. And most of the time... You know, uh, shady business people can tell weak people from strong people. Because when you, when you are talking to them and you, are not, you can't look at them in the face, straight away they can read you. They know you are not confident about something. And then they begin to take advantage. If you go to the bank and you're going to arrange for that loan and the person is talking to you and you, you can't look at them straight in the face and negotiate and stuff like that, they will sell you things you don't need. Yeah, yeah, they will sell you products you don't need. They, they will sell you, they'll give you the mortgage, and then they'll tell you you need an extra loan uh, to do, you know, decorations. Uh, how about a car? Do you need a car loan and everything? And they keep on piling up the loan. Remember, they will tell you we are all here to save you money. And any time they say that to me in the bank, I look at them in the eye and I, I said to them, banks don't save money. And it's always a shock when I tell them that. <laughs> they are wondering, how did he know? I always tell them. 
Would you, would you like to, you know, you say, oh, Mr. Sunu, would you like us to save you money? And I said, excuse me, banks don't save money. That is the truth. They don't want you to know. Banks don't save money. Banks do business with your money. And that's the truth. So anything they do, even if they say they have given you a discount, they still make profit. At your expense, though. So you need to learn how to do I told you the last time. I'm not going to waste time about it because we haven't got I told you, my bank pays me every month. All right? I get three pounds from them. <laughs> every month. That's because of the kind of account I opened. Praise the Lord. So you need to know how to negotiate when you go there. And, and it's all about being courageous and being able to exude confidence. Hallelujah. In the face of adversity. Now, I want to take a story from the Old Testament, a very familiar story from the Old Testament, and we'll begin to um, unpack certain dynamics of this, th this moral quality we are calling courage. Hallelujah. Because sometimes, sometimes, it can be very challenging um, when you are on your own and you need to be courageous. And when the pressure is on, it's even more challenging to be, remain courageous under pressure. But that is when, in fact, that is the time that courage is most needed. Amen? And conviction is tested. Conviction is tested under pressure. Hallelujah. And courage is summoned under pressure. Woo! I think that's a beautiful quote. We have to tweet that. Convictions are tested under pressure, whilst courage are summoned under pressure. That's why the Bible says if you fail in the day of trouble, your strength is small. Hallelujah. Whenever you are under pressure, remember the pressure is summoning you to be courageous. Meanwhile, your convictions are being tested at the same time. And we see that in this passage. So turn to Daniel chapter 1. We are going to look at Daniel chapter 1, part of chapter 2, and we will jump to uh, chapter 4 quickly to round up what I am saying. Yeah. And I hope somebody will be blessed. Lord, give me the strength, the courage, and the grace to preach my heart out this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Daniel chapter 1, verse 11 to 13. The Bible says, So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuch had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Meshael, and Azar Azariah. Okay, Daniel, Hananiah, Meshael, and Azariah. Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who ate, who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servant. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. He consented with them in this matter and tested them how many days? Ten, ten days. Hallelujah. Oh, which we can continue and go back to where the Bible says that when they examine their continents after the 10 days, they notice that these guys were looking, their appearance was looking beautiful, glorious. They look fatter than even those who were eating the king's meat. But this was when a time when Daniel and uh, not just Daniel, but Israel was under captivity in Babylon under the rulership of Nebuchadnezzar, who was a ruthless, wicked king. He doesn't mess around. This guy, if you like, was the power in the world at that time. And he had taken the Israelite captive. Most of the Israelites were uh, in captivity in Babylon. God said this was going to happen anyway. And while they were in captivity, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar actually sent one of his chief officers to go among the captives and look for handsome, wise, young men. The criteria is handsome, wise, young men who are very smart. And these people were going to go through 
a program of deculturalization. In other words, they were going to take them and they are going to strip them of their Jewish heritage. They are going to strip them of their language. They will strip them of their name. Basically, they are changing their identities and they want to turn these people into Chaldeans so that these people will begin to serve in the king's palace. And they are looking for smart people. You have to be smart. And the Bible said that they found a lot of men. But among all these young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Meshael and Azariah, they actually stood out. They were the best of the best, if you like. And they took them through this program where the only criteria was that they are going to learn the Babylonian language. They will learn the science, the culture, and everything of Babylon. And by the way, we have to change, we have to give you Babylonian names. So Daniel was given the name Belshazzar. Hananiah was given the name, what? Shadrach. And Meshael was given a name similar, Meshach. And Azariah was given the name Abednego. And I've seen lots of Christians name their children Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. They are the names of Babylonian gods. And, and find the meaning of those names before you give it to your children, all right? Anyway, so when they strip their name, you see... Anything that you name or rename, you retain control over that thing. So the fact that they gave them names was another strategy to control them. Praise the Lord. And, and they taught them the language and everything. But these boys, somehow, Daniel and his three friends, somehow had come to a place, I believe they were trained well. So they had come to this point where in their heart of heart, they are saying that nothing can take me away from my Jewish heritage. So the Bible said when they, when they changed their names, they said nothing. When they were teaching them the Babylonian culture and the things they do in Babylon and how they should serve the king and everything, they didn't say anything. But the moment they tell them that now you have to eat the food that the king has apportioned for you, Daniel said no. Azariah said no. Hananiah said, no. Mishael said, no, we won't eat this because this is not kosher. It is not our food. And, and in fact, they appointed somebody to oversee, to eat that they are eating the Babylonian food. The king's food looks, you know, is the kind of thing you will pay to eat. But they said no. So they said to the chief that, please, just give us vegetables and water. And check us out after 10 days. If after 10 days you come and we are not looking nice and fat and, you know, succulent, then do whatever you wish. So they challenge the guy. And after 10 days when they came, these men, four guys, were living on just vegetables and water. There's a secret there for fruit fasting, what we call the Daniel fast. That's where it came from. Amen. These things are healthy. They are real. They work. Praise the Lord. At the moment, I'm working on my way towards that. <laughs> Praise God. They, they do work. All right? So, now I don't drink all this Coca-Cola and whatever it is again. This toxic waste. All right? Uh, if you are under 40, you feel free. Help yourself, okay? Take, take it from me. If I were you, I'll get rid of those things even before I hit 40. All right? Okay. So, so when they tested them after 10 days, the Bible said that their countenance, their feature, everything looks better than those who are eating the king's meat. So the chief decided that, okay, you have won. You will continue to eat this forever. Now, how does this teach us something about courage? We need to look at the other scriptures before we, um, before we, we jump into courage. Daniel 2, 13 to 14. Daniel chapter 2, I'm sure you should be there now. Daniel chapter 2, 13 to 14. So in this case, when they negotiated with the chief about what they would eat, it was who, who, who spoke first? Who spoke? Daniel. Daniel. All right. Daniel chapter 2, 13 to 14. What does it say? It says, for this reason, the king was angry. All right. For this reason, uh, where am I? Yeah, verse 13, sorry. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then, with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, 
who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Some translations will say so harsh. Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went and asked the king to give him time. Somebody say, give me time. Then he, uh, to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Meshael, and Azariah. Never abandon your prayer partners. These are people, there were lots of Jewish people in captivity, but we are reading about this for. I'm sure others were doing what they had to do. But because these four have been set aside and brought into the palace, they are now in the limelight. That's why we are reading about them. But I'm sure some of the Jewish do did stuff that didn't you know, end up in the Bible because of what God wants us to know anyway. But, but, but here again, we see Daniel in doing what he does best. What was he doing? Negotiating. He said, please, king, give me time. Because the king had dreamt. And, and the king called all the wise men, the astrologers, the soothsayers, and all the magicians. And he said, look, I had this dream. It's bothering me. But I'm not going to tell you the dream. You need to tell me the dream. And then tell me its interpretation. If you don't, I'll cut off your head. And, and all the magicians said, king, uh, listen, you tell us the dream and we'll tell you what. He said, no. If you, you, your power is real, tell me my dream and the interpretation. And so they started killing some of the magicians because of this. When the news, and they were looking for Daniel, Mishael, and uh, his friends to kill them as well. Because they were in that category. And, and when Daniel heard it, he said to the king, please, hold on, give me time. G give me time. And Daniel went to his friends. They sought the Lord. And God actually revealed the dream and its meaning exactly detailed. Then Daniel went and he said, you don't have to kill anybody. Isn't it amazing? He should have said, King, King, kill all these people. Their God is not God, you know, and save us. He said, no, don't. Even the unbelievers. Talk about Christian godly witness. He said, you don't need to kill anybody. Here is their dream, and here is the meaning of it. And as a result of that, they were promoted. Again, Daniel negotiated. Now, let's jump to Daniel chapter 4, where I begin to explain how we, uh, the dynamics of courage. Daniel chapter 4. And uh, we want to look at from verse 16. Daniel chapter 4 from verse 16. Got to hurry up because of time. Daniel 4, right? Is it verse 16? Just a second. Yeah, Daniel chapter 4, 16 to 18. I hope I got this scripture right. I think it is. Hallelujah. Uh, no, it's not verse 16. That here, 16 again, Daniel explained uh, another dream. But the portion in Daniel chapter 4 that we are looking for is this was when Nebuchadnezzar actually got to this point where he built an image, a golden image. You remember the story? And he said, everybody must worship that image and bow to it. Once again, just like they did with the food. The Bible said that when, they, when the time come and they strike the sound. Daniel what? Look for it. Now, the Bible says that when the time came, everybody bowed. But this time, interestingly, Daniel was not in the picture. Praise the Lord. Daniel was not in the picture. It was only who? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Bible said they, they didn't bow. Now, the news got to the king. Some people went and told the king, the king, everybody bowed. They said those three Jewish boys, they didn't bow to your image. And the king called them and he said, listen, I heard you are not worshipping my God and you didn't bow. And he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. If you don't bow, let, I don't know what God can deliver you because I've prepared a fiery furnace. If you don't bow, I will put you in it. And then they then, for the first time, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah said to the king, that was the first time they spoke, they said to the king, king, we will not even be careful to answer you in this matter. They said, we will not bow. 
You see, sometimes when you have, it is easy to exhibit courage when you have somebody speaking for you. You <laughs> see, when you've got somebody who is the face and they do the negotiating, you can always hide behind them and be very courageous. Because Daniel was speaking for them all the time. But this is where they mastered real courage because at this time round, their chief spokesman was not in the picture because Daniel was going to have his own. His was the lion's den. But these three guys were now exposed where they don't have anybody speaking for them but themselves. And I can tell you honestly that sometimes when you are put under such pressure, if you don't have conviction, forget it. Whatever you say won't hold water. You will not be able to summon courage under such pressure because they didn't bow. The whole nation bowed. They refused to bow. So they stood out like a sore thumb. That was why they picked them out. And when they brought them before the king, Anybody would have become like jelly and wobbly before the mighty king. Because remember, we are talking about somebody who has power in the then known world. And he's prepared to find a furnace burning. Said, if you don't bow, you go into that. And then conviction spoke. And said, king, in this matter alone, we are not even careful to answer you. He said, we have a God who will deliver us. But if this God doesn't deliver, be it known to you that we will not bow. That was conviction. And true to their word, they refused to bow. They put them in the fiery furnace. And the God whom they spoke boldly and testified of before the king showed up with them in the fiery furnace. The Nebuchadnezzar said when he went and checked the day after, 24 hours, these guys were actually walking in hot fire. They have not been scorched. Nothing has touched them. But what amazed him was that he said, did we not put three men in the furnace? They said, yes. He said, now I see four. And the fourth one is like the son of man. It wasn't Christians who were testing. It wasn't the Israelites who were testing. This was a Gentile king, Nebuchadnezzar. He said, the fourth person is like the son of man. And then he shouted, eh, oh, are you guys okay? He said, yes, king, we are fine. He, they brought them out. In fact, those people who took them out were stricken by the fire and they died. But this guy survived in fire. I'm not saying go and jump in fire. That's not what we are saying here. But we are using this as a picture that when you come under intense courage, do you, uh, intense pressure, are you able to show courage? Or do you buckle under the pressure and give in? I remember some time ago, we were having Bible study, and I posed the question that if a madman runs into the building with a gun and says, say Jesus and I'll shoot you. Say there is no God and I'll let you go. How many of you? Somebody raised their hands and said, oh, Pastor, this one is easy. You just say there is no God. When you go out, then you repent. <laughs> I said, eh. Hallelujah. No, that's some of, what some of you would think. But you see, <laughs> somebody say Courage. Sometimes when we are in church like this and we are praying and the worship is good and everybody is praying and, you know, the song and we are worshiping and stuff, you will feel so courageous. But when you are on your own and you come under pressure, what do you do? You see, you are not supposed to be exhibiting courage here in church. What you are supposed to be doing is to be receiving the word and strengthening your convictions so that when you, you see, against the day when you come under pressure. Hallelujah. Amen. Like this gentleman who used to praise God in church. And he goes to church without shoe. But when they are worshiping, he would dance and celebrate and dance and celebrate. And he, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And he be dancing. Then one lady said, this man, you are, you are disturbing. I know what to do. She bought this guy a shoe. Brand new shoe. Gave it to the guy. said, but I want to bless you with this shoe, but on one condition that you stop that jumping, jumping in church. Okay, don't. Yes, here, I know you are believing God for a shoe. Here is the shoe now. Don't dance too much in church. The brother said, thank you. He put on the shoe, went to church. 
that day of all day, his favorite song <laughs> was being played. <laughs> and then the, the guy was, <laughs> he, he was, then he looked at the shoe <laughs> and looked at the lady. <laughs> and then he said, mm -hmm. he couldn't even shout hallelujah. <laughs> he said, mm -hmm. then eventually he remembered the story of David when Saul gave him the armor and he said, King, I can't fight with this for I have not tested them. <laughs> and the guy began to jump and he took off the shoe. <laughs> Look at the woman and he said, shoe or no shoe? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And he began to dance. <laughs> what do you do with such a person? You see, that's a man of conviction. You can't tie him down. Praise the Lord. We need to be people of conviction because when you have conviction and the pressure comes, com as, uh, courage is then summoned. Hallelujah. But when you are without conviction, it is very easy to buckle under pressure. And how many of you know day by day we are coming under pressure? A few years ago, some, some Christians were fired from their job because they were wearing a crucifix. They didn't say anything. They were just wearing cross. And they lost their job. Recently, a footballer, you know, was stricken off in Australia because he said uh, homosexuality is sin. And that's it. Uh, rugby. Rugby footballer. Yeah. That's the sort of pressure we are under. Some of you, because it hasn't hit you, so you don't know. But I want us to pray today. And now Corona is putting more pressure. Yesterday, you know, I saw a, a video clip of uh, two ladies or three ladies. They were fighting over toilet roll. They were fighting over a pack of toilet roll. They were fighting in the shop. They were fighting. My friend, eh, chill. Amen. Oh. Do not panic. Be still and know that God is God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, I don't know who this word is for, but I believe it's for all your people. Some may be under pressure today. We are under pressure. But Father, I pray that we will be able to summon courage with conviction and take our stand for what is right, for what is true, and for what is just. We ask for your blessing upon us. And Father, I pray for your people, every individual under the sound of my voice. Father, may they be covered by your presence. Lord, may the angel of your presence go before us. May the airways, the roadways, the byways, all the nooks and crannies be sanctified. And Lord, may our world be rid of coronavirus forever in the name of Jesus Christ. May fear depart from us. Let courage rise like never before. We thank you and we honor you. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Let's rise up and share the grace. Let's rise up and share the grace. May the grace of our Lord.